Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, this is episode 40 of episode Out of the Episode 40. And then the name of your podcast is? God Quest. God Quest. I saw, okay, I saw that you released a reel or an episode the other day with, I forgot what his name was. But I started watching. I was like, I did not know that you guys had a podcast. I thought that was super cool. Oh, really? Yes. Was it recent? Was it? Yes. Was it I, Luke St. Clair, maybe? I think so. Okay. And I just had started watching it when you, you guys released Fridays too? Okay. I re- I saw it on Friday, I think. Okay, cool. I thought that was cool. Um, So I guess I'll start. I'm originally from Florida. Okay. From South part? Florida. Uh, South Florida. Do okay. you know where Fort Lauderdale, Miami is? Yeah. Okay. I'm from born and raised in Fort Lauderdale. Um, I'll be there next month. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, Ryan Crosley. Okay, in yeah. Hollywood? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I'm just on him. I'm going to be in Fort Myers preaching for the Zunigas that are out of. DZ. Yeah. Oh, DZ. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I'll be there. Yeah, so Ryan Crosley is my <clears throat> wife's cousin. Small world, huh? Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Because I did see the Fort Myers Church post something, and you were on it, and I was like, huh. What's the connection there? Well, here's another connection is before I came to California, I was an evangelist uh, years ago. My wife and I almost moved to Boynton Beach to start a church. I know where that is. Yeah, you know where that is. So yeah. I love that corridor right there. Wow. So that's a great area. So I used to cool go spot. to school in Palm Beach. Okay. In Boca. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Pompano Beach, that whole yes. area all through there. Yeah, that whole area. I know it well. Yeah, I it. I, I used to love it a lot until I moved here, and now I don't want to go back. Yeah, the humidity is a beast. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I don't want to be in the humidity. Humidity and alligators, there Mm-mm. you go. Yeah, no. But um, then I, long story short, ended up at CLC, and here I am, Bible college student. And uh, What year? Yeah, I This is my fourth year. Okay, cool. So I hope to stay in Stockton at least for another year or so, and then we'll see what the Lord has after that. Very good. And then uh, you want to go? Jonathan. I'm from Pasadena, but no one knows where that's at. So I, just I like, know where it is. Yeah, I always say Pasadena. And someone's like, "Oh, where's that from?" I'm like, LA. "Mexico." It's yeah, actually everyone knows where LA is. Pasadena so. is my favorite city in the LA corridor, besides really? Orange County. I went to Fuller. I did my uh, okay. uh, graduate work at Fuller. Wow. So I'm genuinely yeah. shocked you said that. Well, really? Honest, yeah. Yeah. Because no one says that. No one even knows what Pasadena is. Oh man! So my opinion. What, what's, what's the coffee shop? Copa Vida, and I'll, I'll yeah, that hang out through. I'm there. not a coffee person. No. Oh my god! It I'm doesn't not. do anything for me. Yeah, yeah. Let's leave the podcast. <laughs> Don't say that stuff. <laughs> it doesn't work on me. It doesn't make me tired. It doesn't make me energetic. Yeah. It, it's yeah. just coffee. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Man, Pasadena yeah. is amazing. Oh, I love I, it. I love Pasadena. He loves it too. He's uh, yeah. been to my house a couple of times, and he wants to. It's super chill. Yeah, it was just yeah, funny. Yeah, I was yeah. with uh, Jonathan Sanders recently. He had. His only experience with Pasadena was on the interstate passing through, and we were driving to Mexico together. And I said, you've never been to Pasadena, bro? Let me show you how cool Pasadena is. And <laughs> I gave him the Pasadena tour. So that was, that was a lot of fun. What would you show him? We went. I took him downtown. He wanted to see where Fuller was, and then we took him, what's the Langham Resort, and, you know, up by Huntington Library and all that. Okay, but sale Colorado, yeah, all that just, area. Man, amazing. Oh, it's the streets are already paved beautiful. with gold there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what yeah. I think. Yeah. And then um, what about you? I grew up in Louisiana. Okay. Uh, my my dad was a pastor there. He had started church in Georgia, then Texas, wound up in when I was just a young child, pastored in the city of Baton Rouge for many years. Uh, he pastored there 29 years. And I grew up there in uh, Louisiana and uh, wound up, I don't know if you know who John Shoemake is, pastor, first church in San Jose. Uh, Sister Bobby their, Shoemake, their, the singer. Their daughter is Eden? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. That's Ken, folks. Yeah, Eden. Took me a minute. They have a son named Aiden. That It was a mother okay, breakdown okay. right there for a minute. Uh, may, need to, may need to edit that part out. <laughs> uh, no, uh, Aiden Shoemake is the son of John Shoemake. Uh, okay. That's a cousin. Eden's a cousin. Some, I'm not sure how the connection is. I think Eden is Scott Shoemake's daughter. Okay. Think something, something okay. like that. Um, but John Shumake was uh, out of California. His dad pastored in San Jose, California. And um, he and I were very good friends, preacher sons, kind of growing up, doing the same things, general conference, camp meetings, all the above. His mom was uh, a well-known singer in the United Pentecostal Church, Sister Bobby Shumake. And uh, 
they had come to Louisiana. We became friends when we were teenagers. He had come with his parents. He went to Bible school at JCM. We, we became closer friends, and I had wound up as a youth pastor at a church, and I was about to leave there, and he and I began to talk, you know, man, let's do some youth ministry together. And so we began to travel together, the two of us, two single guys going, there was no podcast. So you went and did youth ministry stuff. <laughs> so we preached youth revivals and I played piano and sang, he played the bass. And so we'd go around and we wound up coming to California in 87 or 88, something wow. like that. And uh, while I was here at the Santa Maria campground uh, camp meeting, I saw this chick walking by <laughs> and I'm like, who's that? <laughs> and I fell in love and, and it was the girl I married. Oh, Sheila, wow. uh, who, whose name was Wilson. And uh, that was how I wound up in California. And I uh, was a youth pastor here at the Rock Church, then evangelized again, married, came back as the associate pastor, went, planted a church in San Diego for three years, then came back as the co-pastor and then became the senior pastor here. Gotcha. So that's kind of my journey. And, What's uh, the well, name of the church in San Diego? Uh, now it, it, it was called House of Faith. I think it's Faith Mountain. Pastor okay. Bertram. It's actually in a community called uh, Lakeside. Okay. It was in Santee when I was there, which is, if you know El Cajon, it's on the northwest side of San Diego okay. suburb there. Do you know, I think it's called The Anchor, or yeah. is it The Sanctuary, something yeah. like that? The Anchor. Uh, Larson. Yes. It's Larson. Okay. Yeah. I think my pastor is from that church. Who's your pastor? Uh, Mark Hattaball. Oh yeah. Oh Mar yeah. Mark. In fact, I, I I preached at his church last year or year before last. Really? Yeah. Oh, at wow. the the Brother Crosley's church, they rented y'all's church because they didn't have room for their Spanish conference. And okay, so I cool. I was there with uh with Brother Crosley and Brother Hattaball was there. Yeah. In fact, when I was in San Diego, Mark Hattaball was still at San Diego. Oh wow! And uh, was on the staff there. Yeah, I got a lot of a lot of memories. Cool with Happy Hattaball. That's what <laughs> we called him. That's funny that everybody knows that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He he got he got got me out of a lot of messes. He was a good dude. <laughs> He's, He's a friend. Funny. He's funny. Yeah, he is. Um, I know that you had sent us three different topics, and they're all good. The one the one that I'm not gonna lie, the one that did stick out to me the most was. Uh, I think you said corrupt in worship or uh, corrupting worship, corrupting worship, because just do you know who David Puentes is? Yeah. OK, he just did a podcast last week, I think, and he talked about strange fire okay. and it was like kind of along those same lines. So I was like, oh, this is this is kind of really interesting because it's along that same thing. Um, and then the other one that I had, I'm kind of really curious to hear about is the one where you're talking about making uh what would you say facilitating room for the apostolic church or making accommodation? What did you say? Oh, uh, talking about cap cap uh, uh, op divine opportunity of of uh, I don't know, what did I text you? I don't remember. I, for I forget what the th what the was third it capability one was. and ca capacity. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Those two really interest me a lot. And the third one, I forget what the third one. Divine was. opportunity. Yes. Okay. Okay. And they kind of all to go together. So I didn't know if you wanted to lean into any section of that. Whatever you want to do, <laughs> you can you can take it away. <laughs> well, I think what we're doing right now is an example of opportunities. Your generation, I, how, how old are you guys? I'm 27. 27. 23. 23. 23. 27. Uh, so so you're not you're not kids. You're you're young men. Uh, you're gonna blink and you're gonna be middle aged. It's amazing how fast it <laughs> oh. happens. Okay, and but we're looking at a world where. When I was your age, the world was led by older people. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. Your generation and generation younger, even than you guys, is is leading in a new space, in a new way. Um, and the very fact that we're sitting here, three guys that have never, I think the first time I met y'all was the, Sunday in the night, last week. Last yeah, week, yeah, last yeah. week. <laughs> I've seen you online. I've seen the podcast. Wow, <laughs> what's a podcast? We you know we, we didn't we didn't know what a podcast yeah. was when I was twenty three or twenty seven, yeah. and here we are in a world where we didn't even know each other, and now 
we're ministering together on a global stage. Yeah. I mean, literally, this from this room, we can touch the world. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy opportunity. And and you guys are leaning into that with get out of the or the out of the boat podcast. And you look around, there's I just after I, I connected with you guys, and I had seen you before. I didn't know I didn't know who who you guys were or where you're from. I I had seen a couple of the the podcasts and I've watched there's a there's a generation of this, uh, mm-hmm. of young men and women that are touching the world from a local place. You know, their ministry has gone global. And yeah. this is an example of opportunity that has never existed. I mean, we know what Paul did with a boat <laughs> yeah, and a pen. At times he had to have someone else write it. Evidently he tells that. And then he had to have other people deliver it. I mean, talk about snail mail. That's like hmm. really slow. What would you have done? You know, we've often said, what would the apostle Paul have done if he had an airplane and a passport? Yeah. But now I have to leave that and I have to say, what would Paul do if he had the internet and a podcast or a website or a live stream? I mean, there's no telling what could have been done. So we're living in a day of real divine opportunities. And I know we could, we could curse the darkness. That's easy to do because it's pretty bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be getting worse. Evil seducers are waxing worse and worse. It's not going to get better. All the people hoping for the good old days to come back, not happening. Give up. You, you, you got you got to do something else. So we can either curse that or we can light a candle. And the darker the night, what's the old saying? The brighter the light shines. Mm-hmm. And so opportunities like this have a chance to get out, like in big ways. And uh, what other place would there be a conversation between three guys? I mean, I, I was looking, you know, some of you are getting 3,000 <laughs> views just like quickly, you know, and I'm like, where where would that happen in my world when I was your your guys' yeah. age? I mean, it would have never happened. And so there's incredible opportunity out there. And that divine opportunity is not just technologically uh, happening. It's happening with the raw hunger of Gen Z uh, and even millennials, Gen Z especially, because they're uh, – my son is doing his doctorate on uh, ministry to Gen Z. Oh, wow. He's the youth pastor here. And uh, one of the things that shocked me was, you know, the whole COVID crisis. We live in California. We didn't have the benefit of Florida. <laughs> you know, COVID, I wish we'd have been in Florida. Uh, but what I saw was the youth group thrived during COVID. It, all the people my age, I'm 56 and older, are kind of like, oh, my God, what, what are we going to do? Yeah. The young people are like, bring it on. <laughs> Number one, they never quit partying, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th- they were arresting people all over town for having bar parties. <laughs> mm-hmm. Young people, they didn't care about that. That's why it kept spreading. Mm-hmm. Nobody was locked down. <laughs> they just shut down schools and churches and businesses, and yeah. everybody went and partied with their government money. It was, you know. <laughs> but young people were already in the technology space. Mm-hmm. You know, you want you want to know how to do something, ask an eight-year-old, you know, on your computer. <laughs> well, the young people were already set up for it. And so they were already communicating. They were already, it was normal to them to to be on Facebook and FaceTime and, and you know, all this stuff. So it was just a matter of shifting. Mm-hmm. And they were, now it was their world. They're telling mom and dad how to connect now. They're now driving the the thing because we're not, we're not going to church because we couldn't meet together for what was it a month and a half in California it was pretty tight around here. And then we began to do things, you know, begin to get around that outdoor services. But it was like the crazier it had to get, the more they were into it. Yeah. And we saw our youth group become more spiritual. Now I'm not asking for it to come back. I don't want it back. Right. <laughs> uh, and it, there was a lot of government overreach, all that stuff without jumping into all the conspiracies and all that. But, <laughs> The reality was we learned something about Gen Z. We learned something about young people. They're not afraid of this world. Yeah, This is the world y'all grew up in. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're 27, you're a little bit older, but 23, you're much more attuned to this culture than even me as a 56-year-old. And so you're not, you're not afraid of it. This is your world, mm-hmm. right? And so, uh, you, you know, I pastored in, I pastored in Oakland, uh, for several years, started a church there too, in that somewhere in that mix. Uh, 
and you know, Oakland has the reputation. You know, Oakland's rough. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> Oakland, Oakland can be a crazy place. Oh, yeah. And, but when you talk to people from Oakland, they're like, yeah. man, this is, this is home. Yeah. They, they don't, they don't go to bed at night worrying about it. You know, it's, they, it's their world. They, they know how it functions. They, and so this new crazy world that's scaring a lot of people for a generation of apostolic young men and women, you guys aren't afraid of it. And that's why it's a another reason for divine opportunity is that's what it's going to take is someone that's not looking at how fearful. My, my daughter and son-in-law pastor in Mexico. They live in Rosarito, Mexico. And it's amazing. They laugh. They said, Dad, if you only knew how many people, the first question is, are you scared? <laughs> huh. They're missionaries. The first question, are you scared? <laughs> I mean, like it, it's, it said every conversation starts that. And she said, Dad, I feel as safe where we minister as I did when I lived in Sacramento. Wow. So that's what's got to happen is this generation recognize, wait a minute. We don't, we don't have to be afraid of this crazy evil day. We're God's kids. We're yeah. God's people. And, right. and this is a divine opportunity. That's right. For a, and I could go on and on talking about that. You can tell that's candy stick for me. <laughs> <laughs> um. <clears throat> Yeah, I thought about that uh, for a long time. I didn't, I didn't want to do a podcast. I was like, "Who listens to podcasts? Nobody listens to podcasts." And then almost everybody I talked to, like, "Hey, listen to this podcast." And I'm like, "Why did so many people listen to podcasts?" And um, I know that I felt like God wanted me to do a podcast. I'm like, "Why would I do something I don't even listen to?" And um, I kept praying about it, and I kept feeling like God wanted me to do, it, and I didn't want to, didn't want to, didn't want to. Kept putting it off. Finally, did one episode the most uncomfortable thing in the world. I was like, I am never doing this again. I don't like hearing my voice. I don't like <laughs> any of this. And I and I kept feeling like God wants you to reach certain people out there that are, will listen to a podcast or reach somebody. It's like, yeah, but I'm uncomfortable. And um, kept doing it. And finally, by the third episode, I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, like I got to be committed. I got to do it with everything in me. I got to do what God's called me to do. Started doing it. I brought him on for like one episode, and I was like, "You know what? You're good. Keep yeah, coming." It was like a last second thing. I'm like, "Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's cool." So he's been doing almost every episode with me, and um, I we're kind of shocked sometimes by like the feedback from people. It's like, "Okay, wow, God is working. God is real." Because <laughs> it's like, imagine if we haven't ob like obeyed God and like took that divine opportunity, like you were talking about. How many people? I don't know when they've been touched. Cause sometimes, you know, you're talking to like a mic and you don't, you don't really get to see yeah. the audience. You know, it's a, it's a lot different. It's weird at first, but. Uh, so how, I did, love it how did the two of you connect? Like you brought him on the podcast. Were you already friends at Bible school or what was the connection? I never nearly, nearly no, started to become friends actually at that time. Really? For the most part. Yeah. And when we started becoming friends, we just took off and ran with it. And everyone was confused. Like, how do you guys become best friends? Like overnight, pretty much. It was weird. It wasn't like a, a gradual thing. We weren't roommates. We're roommates now, but before, like, complete opposites. Now we're always wow. hanging out. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So the podcast created an opportunity for a new relationship. Yep. Friendship. Very cool. And he's all the Bible knowledge. No. That's not what <laughs> He's the scholar it. over here. Yeah. Very cool. So with the, I was going to say strange fire, with the corruption in worship, I am so intrigued to hear okay. that. So, when I say the corruption of worship, it has to do with, okay, let's, let's couch it in this overall, let's make the overall subject divine opportunity. Okay. okay, God's at work in the earth. How does he work? The Missio Dei, the mission of God. How does the mission of God happen? It happens through us partnering with him. Right, in that we're his hands, we're his feet, we're we're the body of Christ, and so if there's a work going to be on the earth, in the same way that he had put Adam and Eve on the earth in the original, gave them a garden, take this, fill the earth with it, mm -hmm. dominion, management, you know, bring it, bring it forth, make the whole earth look like earth look like this. Man's failure, all the above, we wind up in the mess we're in. The redemption process all through the Old Testament pushing forward until Christ, Christ comes, and the Christ event, the Pentecost event, 
Now he's got a church. He builds his church. It's a, it's a divine design build project. Okay. Right. The project, this church that is his body in the earth. It's his hands, his feet. If it's done, the mission of God is now done through us. And so we have the divine opportunity of partnering with God. Right. And part of that is to fulfill his mission in the earth. There's a, there's a saying, it's not original with me. I've said it so much I can't even remember who, who said it, but I think it was a guy named Wilbert Shank maybe who said, uh, the church doesn't have a mission. God's mission has a church. Wow. And so it's not about me going and doing this and saying, hey, God, would you bless this? Mm-hmm. It should be, God, what are you doing? How can I get involved? Right. And then blessing just happens because he's going to bless his will. And that's why when I'm outside of his will, I'm not going to be blessed. So that partnership is one dimension of that. The other partner, the other thing not besides partnership is, is I have relationship with him. There's a love relationship with God in that he has redeemed me. He has called me out. I'm part of the, the summoned. I've been brought into this light that I'm not only brought into the light, I'm to spread the light. And in this dimension with him, my worship responsibility coming out of that relationship, we can mess that up. And it's more sacred than we make it. Uh, worship. Worship can get corrupted. And it gets corrupted by flesh. Mm-hmm. And uh, Hosea chapter 8, there's a, there's a big story, you know, the whole book of Hosea is, is a picture of a faithful God and an unfaithful people and a lot of lessons to be learned there and eschatology. We could debate and talk about, about what all that means, but the part that we're, that we're able to take and apply, because that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Look at old Testament scripture and what it, I'm not just like a warrior looking into people's mistakes, mm-hmm. you know, peeking through the window of their past that's there for a reason. I'm supposed to learn from that. As I look at their their successes, why were they successful? Their failure, why did they fail? What can I learn? How do I apply that in this new covenant that I have? And so as we look at the story of Gomer and Hosea, Israel and God, we see how Hosea 8 shows the picture of how they had everything God had done for them, everything he had given them, the blessings, the prosperity, they were beginning to make alliances with Assyria. They were beginning to make, uh, it, it, it's kind of a fine line. You'll see it in uh, in Proverbs. You'll see it in some of the uh, prophets. You can't really distinguish between adultery and idolatry. There's this crossover that in the eyes of God, idolatry is adultery. It's, it's a breaking out of a, a marriage, a relationship, yeah. and that's what it was. That's why Gomer and Hosea were there. And so... Uh, in this, this place that Israel had found herself, she's now taking the blessing of the gold and the silver that had been given to her, the building of the kingdom. You know, every time you look at the blessing of God, it's always tied to purpose. Mm-hmm. It's never meant to get more stuff. Stuff happens, right? You, you get stuff. Blessing it's kind of like, I call it like cholesterol. It sticks to you. You, <laughs> you eat enough donuts, it sticks to you, right? <laughs> you get enough good things that you're spreading out to God, the good things start sticking, right? Well, they things got sticky with gold and silver because he brought them to the land of, of milk and honey, and, and he's delivered them, and all, all the list goes on. Now they've taken that prosperity, and they are now moving to convenient worship. He had given them... You go here to worship. You go here to offer sacrifice. Well, it's too far. And Hosea, the language of Hosea 8 says they were they were building altars. They were, I think the last verse, last next to last or last verse, says they were building temples. So, but in the process of building altars and building temples, said he, uh, he has forgotten his maker. So they're doing ministry they're doing the worship game one place in Hosea 8 it says they they offered flesh and then the next phrase says and they consumed it so 
and I know there's the sacrifices. It was meat. It was flesh. I get it. But as I'm looking, I'm looking at this picture. They're they're doing. They're going through the motions of worship, but it's flesh. Yeah. And then Israel is swallowed up. The next couple of verses, they the, this distinct people who've been called out have now begun to align themselves with the heathen nations round about Assyria, Egypt. There's a whole big Old Testament study of that game they played, and then they were, you know, kings got thrown out. It's, it's a mess. If they had just stayed with God, but they corrupted their worship, and they begin to follow after the idols of the nations round about them. And what they begin to offer, yeah, it's convenient. It's cool. It's, it's worship. It's strange fire. Like Brother Puentes said, it, they're offering, they're doing the church game. I'll put it in our vernacular. Yeah. And I see, sadly, it's not a new thing. Uh, I'm 56. I've come through two or three generations. How many worship leaders, music people, um, even friends of mine, because I, I came through the music scene, uh, that's kind of how I entered ministry was music first. And uh, I know the pull of of connections. I know the pull of sitting across the table from uh, record label executives and the conversations that go on. I've been there when I was younger. And that pulls at musicians, that pulls at singers. And if you're not grounded in the Missio Dei, it's real easy to begin to offer flesh for the silver and the gold. And they took blessing of their worship and they formed golden calves. Incredible, I'm sure. If we'd I mean, golden calf, I mean, what's that worth? How much work did it go into? I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of worship, there's a lot of music, there's a lot of ministry that's organized and cool and hip. Sometimes it's really easy to begin to align with things that are really not about the mission. If so, <clears throat> I know you give the example of the worship leader. What would be an example of, I mean, it can be a worship leader or like somebody offering flesh. Does that make sense? It's easy to pick on the stage mm -hmm. because it's very upfront and you're offering and you're up in front of everybody. And there's really no point where any singer ever really gets out of themselves. like Because if you're singing, you're having to match pitch, right? We hope you match pitch. We want you to stay on key. You don't get lost in the Holy Ghost and go flat, right? <laughs> because then it, then I can't worship because I'm thinking, oh, my God, you're so flat. Quit singing. You, know what I mean? <laughs> like you just affected my worship by you being off. You're being used to the devil now. <laughs> <laughs> but that could be not just on, on the stage with a mic. That could be in ministry where you're doing it for promotion, okay, you know, you're giving to be seen. Is that offering, is that's offering flesh? I, I think it would be. Okay. You know, it's, you're building temples, you're building altars. Yeah, I'm giving to the church, but you're, for example, Ananias and Sapphira, they gave. I mean, that, that's what's so stupid to me. I'm like, I wish I could have gotten just shook. I'm like, dude, why did you do yeah. it? You, you gave. Yeah. Why don't you just tell what you gave? Why don't, Why are you fronting like you're doing one thing? I mean, they sold they sold this and and acted like they had done this much. There was no limit. There was no like requirement of what they were supposed to give. Yeah. That was all on them. They did this flesh thing, and God said, "Not in this new covenant. We're not playing that game." <laughs> I mean, that's the that's pretty incredible. That's like the first problem in the church. Yeah. Of the New Testament church. And he he's like, No, we've done that before. I'm I don't do the hypocrite thing. <laughs> You're done. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty sobering, you know. Yeah. And that was an offering. It was a form of worship, a form of godliness, but it wasn't the power thereof. And as a result, God says, No, I'm not I'm I'm just establishing right off the bat. I don't accept every offering, especially ones that are done with pretense that there's something else going on. Interesting. That would be an example. Uh, and, and people can, you know, fasting. Go on. I was, I had, a, I had a thought. I don't want to lose it. Okay. 
Would you, <laughs> this sounds so carnal. Would you think that, okay, I'm not going to lie. There has been times where I needed money. And so I was like, all right, well, I have a hundred bucks. Let me just give the whole thing. Cause God is going to bless me. Right. <laughs> so in the past, I'd be like, this is years ago. I'll just yeah. put that out there. But like, I'd be like, man, like I really got to pay my bills. Um, I know that the Bible says that God will bless me. He, I can out give God and like, I'll give like a hundred bucks. And I know like the bill comes, don't got the money. Nothing ever happens afterwards. And I'm like, is that like, is that God punishing me? <laughs> or, or like, was that me being wrong in my spirit? And so it's like, okay, I'm not going to bless you for that. I, know, I have never been asked, asked that sorry. question. <laughs> it's just okay. So uh, let's let's unpack that. <laughs> I would say at best you were sincerely wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, not with guile. I would say that is that is a young man that's trying to figure out this game, right? And okay, kind hey, of, the preacher said it. Let's do it. Kind of like. I guess the way that I looked at it was like, okay, if I put in like this token, I should get this return. So almost like God is like a gumball machine. Yeah. He, or he's like Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> like give it. And that's kind of the, the, the televangelist prosperity doctrine. Yeah. Give a hundred dollars and <laughs> bless God. If you'll sow a seed right now, a yeah. <laughs> hundred dollars and you're expecting a Cadillac tomorrow. After yeah. I yeah. watch. Yeah. I don't think that's the right motive. Okay. I think there's a I think there's flesh in there, right? I will not I will not deny some of we preach it. We preach it because we, we do have the story of the widow that gave to the prophet, right? We we have those. And the reality is is I could point to places where I gave a gift of faith and God met the need. So it's not the same as building a golden calf. Okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't equate that. I would say that maybe that's misunderstanding of how favor flows, uh, figuring it out, learning from it, and obviously, you're sitting here now going, "No, it wasn't the right thing." <laughs> but I don't think. I don't think there was a lightning bolt from heaven about to explode on you like Ananias and Sapphira or something. I don't. I don't know if this is totally off topic, but this is something I've always wanted to ask. Um, Say and you, so you're just gonna ask a total stranger that you just yeah. Well, I've, I I just I feel like maybe you could possibly answer it, and I feel like you've you've had the same. Yeah, question. I'm waiting for the theologian to weigh in on this. <laughs> no, I, Apostle <clears throat> Jonathan, no, for real. I I you. Oh, I think we've had this conversation before. Um, say, okay, I have you know my savings account, my checking account, and there's been times where like okay, like have a little bit in my savings and then they do one of those services where like oh we're raising for you now the uh to build a church in india or yeah. something like that and i'm sitting there thinking and i have money in my savings account and i almost there's times where even it won't even be that service i'll feel guilty for having saved something in my bank account and i feel like there's been times where i literally feel like god's like empty it and i'm like Okay, you're gonna need to tell me that with an audible voice because <laughs> I'm about to go broke and you're gonna have to come through. And there's been okay, I'm not gonna lie, there's been times where I've just emptied it and then I feel like in a I've been kind of not like abandoned, but I'm like, okay, it's just coming in the form of food or something. <laughs> but I need yeah, something. I didn't get killed in a car. Yeah, so like here. how do you con oh, why not? It's a great confirm. question because we do have scriptures where it's very plain. You're gonna you're gonna give sacrificially, right? Mm -hmm. But the Bible talks about Israel when there there came a point they're they're taking earrings off, they're taking bracelets off to build the house of God. But even in that point, it was as the heart is willing. So giving, like in that that area, it was more than just the taking off and becoming a holy people. It was about something happened in their heart, right? There came a point where the man of God had to tell, okay, that's enough. We don't, you don't need to give anymore. Now I've never been in a service where that's happened yet. Right. <laughs> uh, I'd love to see that, you know, the, the kingdom be so blessed, but that actually happened. Um, it, wow. Amazing with people that didn't even have the Holy ghost yet. You know, it was an old Testament event, uh, but their hearts had been so moved. So I think giving is tied to the heart. I mean, like, I heard people say he'll take it from a grouch, but he loves a cheerful giver, right? 
there's something about what God accepts, and, and we know he doesn't accept. He didn't accept Cain's offering. He accepted Abel's. He didn't accept Ananias and Sapphira's. I think there is a dimension that's connected to the heart. There will be times that as a believer, we will pour it all out. I've done that. I've emptied the bank account. And I have waited. Okay, God. Yeah. Uh, is this one of, be those, one of those mailbox stories <laughs> I hear preachers preach about? Me too. Yeah. Check the mail all the time. Yeah. And the reality is I've had that happen. I pastored in Oakland, uh, and I had a lady in the church that was, this is a true story. It's unbelievable. It's a true story. She was, I think, four or five hundred dollars short of her rent. She worked a job, fixed income, not a lot of upward mobility in her life. Just a single mom struggling. Bay Area, Oakland, rough and tumble, just getting by. She came to me one Wednesday night and said, Pastor, you're not going to believe what happened today. She said, on my way to church, I was $400 short. I think it was $400. And she said, I pulled up. She told me the street. I think it was 97th and her burger or something like that. She said, I looked out the window, and there was a brown paper bag no way. on the street. Huh. And something said, pick it up. And she reached down. Opened the door, reached down, picked up, and there were four one hundred dollar bills in it. Wow! And she handed him. She said, "Pastor, look what God did." She showed them to me. And there are those very real moments that happen. And I've had I've had moments like that when I was pastoring in San Diego. We uh, we had taken it was a restart of a church that had completely dissolved, and it was an, they were repossessing the building. It was a it was a disaster, and uh, we were short that month and it was to the point where I couldn't mail it. I was going to have to take it to the bank. You know, that was over in La Jolla. And I was like, God, I was working a job. I was pastoring and there was only at the time about eight people in the church, but the ch there had been a church building previously, but all the members had left and it, it was a disaster. Wow. And I was paying the note and living in the Sunday school class to, to make it happen. And we were close. Like, it was, it was rough, and a first-time visitor, never before, never since, don't know how they found the church, never really even got their name other than met them, and they disappeared after church, and I never saw them again. But they put an envelope in with the exact amount that was due the next morning. Wow. So <laughs> there will be times when that comes through, where we're overtaken by the blessing. But... And there's time that I've given saying, God, you know, I need a blessing. I'm going to sow a seed of faith. There is that dimension. But sometimes it can be, for whatever reason, that it may not be the right thing. Because we also have scripture that says, consider the ant. Oh, you sluggard. Hmm. You know, you know, he's he's not, he's working. He's storing up for winter. Because there's, so that's the balance is where is, is Am I doing that just out of emotions or did all my friends give so I want to give or, you know, you know wh where does the keeping the right hand from knowing what the left hand's doing? So there, there's a dimension that I think when it comes to giving, yeah, you can, you can even give out of the flesh to be seen in men. You know, you can even pray like the Pharisees, or the scribes standing on the side of the road. Oh, I thank thee, God, that I'm not as one. You know, so there's a dimension where any form of worship and ministry can be flesh. Can you give <clears throat> with a with a wrong heart, but not a cheerful heart, even if you feel to give, okay, I know God's calling me to give $100, but ugh, I really don't want to. I'll do it. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to give it. But, like, this is all I have left. It, because I wasn't cheerful about it, God's going to, like, take my 100 bucks and be like, all right. <laughs> like, I'm not. I don't know. You ain't getting anything yeah, in return. Yeah. You know, I, I, think, I think that's probably an individual by individual case, and God is the judge. You know, it's kind of like uh, my father-in-law has a saying, you know, if you're putting out a fire, even a cracked pot can carry some water. It may it may drip all the way to the fire, but just <laughs> if it's got a little bit, let's get it. Just, ever, just hand me a pot. Let's throw water on it, right? Yeah. So in the kingdom of God, 
Yeah, a cheerful giver is what he loves. And I think there's a dimension of blessing that's, that, that only the cheerful giver is going to get. But it's giving and receiving. God, you're not going to outgive God. No. You know, and at some point, you know, how much of that is our own emotions? How much of that? Hey, God understands all that. I don't think you were in danger of hellfire because you gave, thinking you're going to get a free meal later on. Uh, God knows our heart. And if we're like David, if even with all of our mistakes, if we're after him, if we're following after him, even to the point where I've really messed up God, but I, I want to get back on track, I think I think we'll be okay. Thank God. <laughs> Is it? Do you remember the question that I was talking about a while ago about like having a savings? No. No. Okay. Well, I think it's okay to have a savings. No. Yeah, because there I forget who I was talking to also. Oh, okay. So I'll give a concrete example. You've been to the CLC parking lot, right? Okay. You ever been that rocky off road thing? Okay. So the West Lane where did you go to Lind you went to Linderos, yeah. didn't you? So if you go to the back it's like you need a four-wheel drive vehicle. Okay. It is so bad. And so I think to myself sometimes, you know, say there's, uh, I was talking to a family at the church because we had a business uh, class. And so this family was talking to us about, you know, like, what were they talking about? Saving money and just a lot of yeah. business stuff. And so they let us ask questions at the end. And I had said to them, I said, what stops, let's first say an example a millionaire family from just paying, you know, like dropping the bucket for them, just yeah. pay to just pave the parking lot, you know, yeah. is, is there something that, I don't know, like, <laughs> I don't want to say like that wealthy people know that like, cause for me, I was like, man, if I had all that money, I would pay this parking lot tomorrow. Well, yeah. but is there like something that is like, does God want the, the church to, almost struggle in a sense to pray for it or not just have it easily handed to them that is stopping people from doing that or I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a tough question. And there, there's there's times in that I've asked the same thing like, man, I would when people don't give, I really wonder why they don't, mm -hmm. honestly, because I've I've seen the blessing of God in giving. But then there's also the other side is that sometimes we think wealthy people have tons of expendable income when they may not have any more reachable cash than you or I. Yeah. Because they're they're you know, it's like the difference in, let's say, a wealthy guy and a lower income, it, it let's say they're both paying their bills. I'm not talking about people that are mismanaging, but you got two people, you got a guy that's doing a good job and a guy that's doing a good job here, they're just at different levels. A lot of times there's not a lot of difference. It's just higher expenses at a higher level. Gotcha. The only difference is the amount of zeros. And so sometimes we equate, well, he's got a lot. He's got a big time job. Why, why isn't he giving more? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think God kind of understood that because he, he designed a program where everybody gave 10%, mm -hmm. that it was equality, not in a socialistic standpoint. I don't mean it that way, but it was that everyone, there was a, there was a process and, are there are there wealthy people that should give that don't? Absolutely. Are there not so wealthy people that don't give that should? Absolutely. And I've watched people be extremely blessed that were extreme givers that were awesome givers. And I've seen I've seen single mothers that didn't have hardly two pennies to rub together were incredible givers. Wow. The amount may have been different, but the percentage of income that they had that I knew their struggle. Amazing. Wow. And uh you know, there's a lot when you get into the subject of giving that I don't understand. Uh, there may be some conversations in heaven, you know, like, you know, and what could we have done different? You know, how could we have done better? And I think, again, it comes back to the heart. I don't think we can guilt people into giving. I don't think we can make them feel happy about giving to point. I think, I think at some point after I'm done with all my gymnastics, yeah, either – Scary stories are funny stories to get people to give. When, when we're done with all that, if it doesn't touch the heart, it's never really going to get done. Yeah. I Okay, I, have, I don't know how we got on this topic, but I, I love this topic. I have one more question. Okay. Say you have credit card debt, 
and I know a lot of our, a lot of friends have credit card debt. Yeah. <laughs> what if what if you feel led to give an offering? Would that be bad? Like giving, like when you have a bunch of credit card debt, you know what I mean? Well, <laughs> man, you know how to ask these tough questions. Like, I'm sorry. Like, here's a total stranger. <laughs> a different route. <laughs> no, out of nowhere. Like, I don't know heck? how this route came to be. We have corrupted this podcast. <laughs> no, honestly. <laughs> I'm just, these are questions that I've been wanting to ask for years. I don't know why this came about. Okay, let me answer it this way. If... If <clears throat> I don't, I don't think you can treat an offering to God like a bill, right? So people pay their bills with credit cards and create more bills. That's not financial stewardship. Okay. Okay. We've got credit card debt either because we needed, let's just, use, let's don't make it all bad because we, we use credit cards. Let's don't make centers out of saints over credit cards. <laughs> credit cards play a vital role, right? And there's ways there's ways to use credit cards uh effectively paying bills, getting points. I mean, you can you can you learn how credit cards work and you pay them off and you figure out how to do it, you can use them to your advantage in a way that you can't with cash, okay? And now all the Dave Ramsey fans will be, you know, they'll be going crazy right now. <laughs> uh, but the reality is we have credit cards. And there are times that we have to use credit cards, emergencies or whatever. And obviously, we wish we all had a big stack of cash somewhere for that. Yeah. Uh, but the majority of people in the church don't have that. And I would encourage them to try to build that up. But having said that, to take that credit card and just go, oh, here's Here's a hundred dollars because because I don't have the discipline of bringing an offering to church. Or oh, I'm in trouble and I feel guilty. So here's a hundred, and I just added another bill. I guess if you pay the bill off, it's great. But here's what I don't think God will bless: is you got bills of stuff you bought that you didn't need to impress people you don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is what a lot of credit card. I gotta have this Louis Vuitton purse. I gotta have, I gotta have this cool new coat, whatever it may be. Okay, if you can afford, it, that's cool. I'm not, I'm not here to debate that. That's not the issue. I like nice things, but when we're we're just rolling our our debt up. But when I bought that that pair of shoes, that I I, mean, I, I could have bought a hundred pair, a hundred dollar pair, but I. I bought that five hundred dollar pair because I wanted it to yeah. look cool at Landmark or No Limits or Linderos. I, you know, I want to walk in them, notice my shoes. Okay, that's five hundred dollars. Let's say I make two thousand dollars a month, and after my car note and my bill, everything, I've only got two hundred dollars left. So I go put. I either give two hundred dollars. That I've already told Sears or that's Sears. I just dated myself. <laughs> uh, I know what Sears well, is. Uh, I, I, what's a store now? Uh, Nordstrom. It's Macy's Nordstrom. Okay. I've already told Nordstrom because I bought that $500 pair of Meslons that I'm going to pay that. So now I get in a Holy Ghost service and I, and I tell God, oh, uh, I, I already promised them I would pay that off. Uh, but I'm not going to pay them. I'm going to give an offering to you. God's not going to bless that because you just broke a contract. Yeah. You broke a promise. And you're just indebting yourself. Or you're. It's like people think, well, I gave to the church. God's going to pay my bills. I'm not going to pay my bills. No, God's not going to bless that. You're going to be in more trouble than ever because you're robbing from Nordstrom Yeah. to give God. God's not going to accept that, right? So I would say credit card giving, except in crazy uh, exceptions, I, I wouldn't advise it. What if, okay, you're, say you have like 2000 bucks on your credit card, but you have, you just got paid some cash, mm -hmm. you gave your tithe, you paid some bills, and then you want to give offering out of your cash. That, that you, but you're going to access it through a credit card? No. 
this is like from your direct deposit. Say you just got paid a thousand bucks, pay a couple bills, you pay tithe and offering, and you have like two hundred bucks left over, but you have a high credit card bill, and you should be paying that bill. Like, yeah, I'm gonna give an offering instead. Is that the same thing? I think if you're pay- if you're paying what you agree to, like like the minimum payment or something. I mean, it's not it's not good management, but maybe you do that for a season, maybe you do it for a month, maybe you know that's that would be where I would lean and say, you know what, talk to your pastor. You know, if if that's where you are, talk to your pastor, get a plan. Is that would God bless that in in that I I, I would say he would bless, but I don't think that's a, that's what he planned for your life. Yeah. I would say if you're having to juggle that much, there's a management issue. There's a money management, a time management, a planning. You know, okay, what what else got to do that's better than that? And yeah. get that debt down. Get it to where you're not having to do that. You know, and and the apostle said, bring a prepared offering, not just oh my God, credit card. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> not what, uh, a prepared. And you look at Deuteronomy 26, which is an incredible count of tithing even the tithe was they were to they were to take that first fruits not the last fruits the first fruits then they were to bring it before the basket and then they were to say and proclaim in front of the priest because he he tied the possessing of the land with the tithe and all of that so there was a lot of work to get to the basket yeah. it wasn't this just oh let's make it convenient that wasn't the point i don't know how we got into a dave ramsey class but <laughs> to to kind of go back into offering and flip it into we were talking about uh, worship and you're talking about tithing. Do you think that we should, I know this kind of sounds cheesy, but tithing ourselves every day. So what would be 10% of 24 hours? (laughs) 2.4. Like, do you think that there should be like a certain number of hours that we should be tithing of ourselves daily? Okay. So it's a good question. And we're going to be judged with our time, our talent, and our finances, right? Mm. That's that's what we're going to be judged on. What did you do? I gave you this. I gave these years. I gave you this amount of money. I gave you these talents. What did you do with it? So, but think with me. So you, you work a job from, let's say you work 10 hours today. So that 10 hours is a contract you made with the company. You're a plumber. You work for the plumbing company. When you got hired, you entered into an uh, an agreement. I will work for you 40 hours a week, whatever it is, however many hours you agree to, for I think my value is this much. If it's minimum wage, that's how much I think I'm worth or, or what I bring. And they say, okay, yeah, we think you're worth that. You give us 40 hours. We'll, it's an exchange. Okay, yeah. Work is I'm exchanging my time and my talent for your company, okay? So I will give you that 10 hours today or whatever it is. I would just make that because I'm not good at math. I like 10s. <laughs> and so I'm going to get that amount of money for every hour and the total hours of the week. So let's say I worked uh, 10 hours for four days. I've got 40 hours, mm-hmm. Okay. So those 40 hours I got paid however much per hour. Then as a steward of God's kingdom, I look at that and I say, okay, this is the amount of money I made. This is is my income. Okay, this is what I profited. Now I'm going to take the first fruits before I do one thing with that. Okay, and I take that. Here's the amazing thing. This is what people don't understand. Often they don't understand this, is that the moment I take that money, And I put that in the offering plate or the offering basket. And I say, God, here's your tithe. Because the earth is Lord, the fullness thereof. And that's what he asked for is the first fruits. You give him the first fruits, he'll bless the 90. Okay. If you wait to give the last 10%, there's nothing left to bless. But when I come and bring the first fruits, the moment I put that, I'm now in an exchange with God. I started the week in an exchange with my company. I said, I'll give you these hours for that amount of money. They say, let's do it. When I get to church and I bring my tithe, I look at God and say, here's your tithe. He says, let's do it. And in that moment, 40 hours, he counts 
is all his. Gotcha. Because I just exchanged my time, and God says, I, I'm not asking you to give me all 40 hours. Just give me what you produced in those 40 hours. Give me 10% of that. I'll accept that. Tithing is not hard when you understand the revelation of the tithe. I just got revelation. <laughs> yeah, it's an exchange. <laughs> so you don't have to go to bed and go, oh, my God, I, I worked all day. I'm exhausted. I, I didn't pray three hours. I didn't. I didn't knock doors for three hours. I, I, I didn't have time to read my Bible today. It was, it was hectic. The moment you walk in with that tithe, God says, I accept that. Wow. Your tithe is very spiritual. Don't, don't ever let anybody take the tithe out of your faith because the tithe is very much connected to the kingdom. And the way we do it is we exchange because I got paid for my time. That's how I got the money. I gave that company my time. And now 10%, God says, you bring 10% of that? It's the equation because I took what I earned. That's my livelihood. So the tithe is, is, an, is an opportunity for even that guy swinging a hammer all day. People's cussing. They're pumping rock music everywhere and rap music, and he's working with people that don't even know God. It becomes a sacrifice of worship. The moment that tithe hits, that week's work became a sacrifice of praise. Wow. It's a very spiritual thing. Wow. Do you have any questions? Not pertaining to that specific subject. You can ask <laughs> Once he gets back on track to the <laughs> sacrificial. Well, you, you can bring us back around. <laughs> bring us back around. <laughs> I feel like something I've noticed around churches, not just in California, just around, I guess, the country is there'll be preachers who are, I guess, very proper and very kind of like when music's going on, worship, they're just very just pinch themselves, just not worshiping. But yet when they get to the platform, they're, they have all this energy that they didn't have during worship. I, you have obviously more experience. You've seen more than I have. How would you correlate that? Like how would you, you can, know what I'm trying can, to say? Like, be, yeah, no, I, I understand. Uh, it can be, it can be a problem. Like I've seen that, observed that. Uh, and I work very hard not to be that way, and I think all of us should. There's also, you, and not every case, but there are times, honestly, in more of a sober, uh, um, I'm going to be bringing a sober message where maybe God's dealt with me about, you know, there's a real prophetic weight on a service, and I come into the service, I've been praying, I've been fasting, I've been studying because I've got to deliver this word and it's not going to be an easy, it's not going to be the, you know, praise him. It's not, it's not going to be the organ jamming behind me and us shouting across. It's going to be, it's going to be heavy. And my spirit is, is not on the same page with Music. Ah, hands off. You, be. <laughs> you know, but I'm in a different space yeah. because I've been with God. And so in a way, I'm a little bit disconnected. And you'll see that maybe with people that are more uh, gift-type ministries, uh, more prophetic, is because they're, they've kind of zoned out. Okay? It's funny you say that there. Um, one time we had um, Brother Bounds came, and he had brought a friend with him. Um, you might know him. I'm not going to say his name right now, but he <laughs> we walked in Brother Bounds, and then um, the uh, other uh, preacher came behind him, and we we're like, "Hello, brother, so and so." And he just looked at us, looked around, and I'm we're thinking, "Oh my!" And he was just looking like into the distance, and they were like, "Oh, right this way." And he just totally just like out. Even in services, I because after that, I'm like, "I'm gonna keep an eye on this guy." <laughs> and so even in like so it was landmark. I'm looking down where he was, and he's just, and I'm like. It's like what is what is he seeing? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought about. And, and it's not always that case. And some people are just they're built different. Uh, I get it that it is. It can be frustrating if, if it's not my personality. There are times that that I'm I am disconnected because I know where I'm going. Um, Brother Morgan, Mark Morgan, he used to he used to be notorious for coming in late. 
And it was, I mean, we, we talked about it and there were times it was like, he said, no, I'm, I'm coming in late on purpose because I can't, I can't go where God's taking me to go and deal with announcements. And, you know, and especially if for me, I'm just like a wing it guy. Right. Uh So that doesn't bother me except in certain cases, but people that are, their personalities may be different. Their approach to ministry may be different. Their approach to the pulpit may be different. And so I, I'm always careful, you know, I know what it's like to to look over and feel like, man, nobody's, I'm preaching and they're not getting with me. You know, come on, preachers, get with me. You know? <laughs> uh, but, but that may be, uh, Siri just said she didn't get that. <laughs> I heard that over there. Uh, you know, I I would be very careful to just label it that way. But to every preacher watching and young preacher watching, people do notice that. Yeah. And it does become a conversation like, you know, they want us to worship, but they're not worshiping. Yeah. So. Sure. And it wasn't like, just to clarify, it wasn't like, why aren't they doing that? It was more so me wondering, like, if there was like a certain reason. I mean, you explained it yeah. well. Sometimes they're just in the flow of things. Yeah, and sometimes, sometimes they need to do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> Should I stop worshiping? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that all the questions you had? Yeah, I'm going to let him take his liberty. Okay. okay. That, that's all the questions I had. Do you have anything more to say? No, just, just, if we can keep the big picture is we work for him. Yeah. And it's not about getting him to bless what we're doing. It's about us blessing what he's doing, blessing with our lives, with our worship, with our giving. If we bless him, that's where the, that's where the magic happens. I have one question. Okay. It's, I don't know if it's like a bold question. You're, you're WPF. Yeah. Or UPC, different organizations for those who don't know what that is. Me, I don't care going no. to WPF Church, AA, IPOL, or e- what is it? E-pool. Yeah. all that. I-pool. Why do you think there are certain people who are very anti other organizations? Very, oh, I'm not stepping foot in that WPF Church. I'm not stepping foot in that UPC Church. Yeah. You know, like why can't? Why are more people open minded, more like accepting of different organizations? Yeah, that was a bold question. That is a bold it's question, but, it, but, but, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's it's a it's a great question, and I would answer it this way. There there can be a variety of reasons, right? There can be reasons why people are in an organization, and there can be reasons why people are not in an organization, or change organization. I would hope that none of it was to bring damage to one another. Number one. I would hope that it would never be about sectarianism where we are separating so that we can lob bombs at each other, right? <laughs> uh, that's wrong. Yeah. There are, there are let's say, there are philosophical approaches to ministry, like philosophical differences in a family. Like if you have a brother who's married with his family that lives in Alabama, let's just make it up, and you live in Florida, he may run his family very different in his house than you run yours, mm-hmm. but it's still your brother, yeah, right. And what what I may do may be unique in my circle, like my house, mm-hmm. that my family member may not do exactly the same way. Right. You know what we do at the table, what we do at the house, what you know how we how we run the house, you know. And so there can be philosophical differences and people identify with certain approaches uh, or stands for particular things that they feel that's a different direction than this. I don't feel comfortable in this. but And so they separate uh, as far as organizationally. There may be situations where uh, there are, sadly, there are political things that happen and some people leave our start, our stay for politics, then there can even be where people cloister and block everybody out because they're not like you said. To me, that's dangerous. Uh, Am I I used to be in the UPC. Uh, I don't hate the UPC. I love the UPC. I I love friends, family. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll end with this, okay? So 
Man, this podcast is probably going to get out there, right? For real, way to we've take a turn, Jonathan. We've, ta- we've talked about money. We've <laughs> talked about... Uh, so I'm going to have everybody mad at me. Okay, so so to all of my UPC, UPC friends, I love you. All of my Apostolic Assembly friends, I love you. All my WPF friends, I love you. All of my GIB, good independent brethren, I love you. Oh, I was like, what is all that? My GIB. Yeah, I was like, good that's independent brethren. That's a new brethren, one. Right? Okay. Uh, and so... I love everybody, right? And and if 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 anybody misunderstands that, whatever. Okay, so here's how I explain for me. Okay, I have two knee replacements. Okay, it it was uh, had to be replaced. One was like 15 years ago, and one was like eight or nine years ago. Okay, I didn't get knee replacements because I hated my old knees. <laughs> right? Okay. I learned every basketball game I played, I played on those knees. Every football game I played, I played on those knees. Every step I took, I climbed the Eiffel Tower on those old knees. They were shot. Okay. <laughs> but from years of basketball and football and being a big guy, and there were some there were some hereditary issues, there were some things in there. Uh, that began to wear and some tears and some little things that happened. I had to have six meniscus surgeries. And so I got to where it was bone on bone. It was rubbing, right? And the pain was pretty bad. It was difficult. And it was affecting things in me, right? And I reached a point that what I had become my knees would no longer support without it being very painful and frustrating. Yeah. So I had knee replacements. The first knee replacement, the doctor, when they released me, they said, Mr. Young, you have just undergone the most painful surgery done to the human body. And I can't tell you how painful it was. They didn't put you under? Yeah, they put me under, but it, it the pain that when you come out knee replacement, especially wow. 16 years ago, was it was unbelievable pain, and literally I thought I was going to lose my mind. I mean, mm-hmm. 16 years ago I was 40 years old. I mean, crying like a five year old, and <laughs> it, pain like un, unbelievable. They basically amputate your leg and leave the skin on, leave the kneecap, and then they they take a big. Oh. Uh, Basically a tack and nail, oh. nail into and, and so it's painful. Okay. And if you just go Google, look up pictures of mm-hmm. knee replacement, right? It was painful. I had to change, right? For me, because of but I didn't go tell everybody else, hey, you need to change your knees. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't go tell people to change knees. Yeah. And I didn't hate my old ones because I'm not in the UPC, but I love the UPC. Every sermon I learned to preach, I learned in the UPC. I, every every revival I went to, I mean, I grew up in the UPC. My life just, for me, not for you, not for anybody else, for me it was that. And so I think it's a mistake for us to judge one another. Yeah. We all have our world. We all have our moccasins to walk in. And we have a ministry to unfold. Yep. This thing about divine opportunity, we can't miss our divine opportunities by hating one another or fighting one another or, or getting ourselves in our little worlds. Do we have differences? Yeah. And if we have differences, let's talk about them. If we have things that we feel are pretty important, let's hang on to those. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to holier than thou you. You know, I'm 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 not going to do that to you. Don't do that to me. Let's be brethren. Let's let's put the swords down. Let's be the body of Christ. I mean, I don't always see things the same way. I have a brother and a sister. We live in different worlds. We don't see everything alike. We don't do everything alike. But that's still my brother. Yeah. And I may talk about him, but don't you talk about him. <laughs> right? You know, the world may do what they're going to do, you know, but you're my brother. Yeah. And when I look at the New Testament, there's a lot of mess in some of those churches. I mean, you look at the church at Corinth. 
man, there was some there was some pretty gross sin, but they were still the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. And as long as we're breathing and God's working, then let's do the due diligence of of working through the scripture. Let's let's figure out what we got to do and how to do this right. But let's don't go to hell fighting over apostolic organizations. Yeah. Because I believe we can we can get into the offering of flesh yeah. while we're building temples. Yeah. Back boy, see how we came back? Yeah. We we can get in the flesh and offer things to God that he's not pleased with. Yeah. And uh so, you know, uh I know there's people that have different feelings on that, and right, we probably just created a whole new thread on Insta- <laughs> Instagram or what what we're doing. But I think the bottom line is we've got to love one another, yeah. and there's not going to be a WPF section in heaven and a UPC section in heaven, and then all the Spanish apostolics over here, and then all the Filipino church over here. It's it's not going to be that way. It's the body of Christ. And while we're on earth, we're having to work through all this, but let's just, let's work through it and let's go to heaven together. And the crazier the world gets, the more we need each other. Yeah. Wow. Well, usually I ask those type of questions. That was pretty <laughs> bold coming from you. Um, well, if you have nothing more to say, do you have another qu- I'm afraid to ask if you have another question. No, no. <laughs> You've answered too many hard questions from him. So. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and I, I'm not afraid of that question. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's actually a great question because, you know, while while preachers may be fighting those issues, there's a lot of saints that are like, man, I don't understand all that. We're, yeah. Aren't we the people of God? Yeah. And and I'm not belittling the need for organization. I'm, I'm not anti-organization. I believe in organization. and. And uh, there's things that organization brings, and particular organizations have incredible strengths that maybe the other one won't. And uh, you know, maybe maybe we just join a bunch of them. Maybe that'd be the answer. <laughs> I don't know. And boy, that'd be another fight. That'd be another fight. There. Uh, but I think the bottom line is, at the end of the day, we are the body of Christ, and we are brethren, and we're all we're all going to heaven. Let's let's right. make sure we get there. Right. Well, this has been episode 40 of Out of the Boat. The big 4 <laughs>